and this will be uh, the linear span, this will have an orthonormal basis, we will first of all pick our favorite vector, e minus 1. So these are semi-infinite things like this. And then the other, or rest of the orthonormal basis are things like this. Where I1 is greater than I2. So this is just, these are just, it's just like familiar, uh, it's the exterior. So eventually they end up with those tails, and that's just a convenient way of doing it. So uh, the usual Dirac C is that you, you think of If you, you can describe, you know, this is the ground state, the vacuum, and the others obviously are described by filling in boxes. So, uh, and then what, what will happen is if, if you go this way, then eventually all the boxes are empty. And then if you go this way, all the boxes are full, eventually. So that's the usual description of the ground state. Anyway, uh, you can then make Eis act by exterior multiplication in, in the obvious way, and then the Ei stars, unsurprisingly, will act by contraction. So that's the adjunct. And if you extend, you define A of F to be sigma. Uh, AI EI if F is equal to sigma AI. This is an absolute bad notation. But I know AF star similarly. <coughs> then uh, the relations that you could check just for those uh, generators will become the canonical anti commutation relations, which are AF. But these operators and and that they you take the adjoints that's just the inner complex inner product times the identity. Uh, now in physics this is we're really doing this the uh, from uh, the operator algebra way. So of course, when you get to physics, everything has to be reversed. Uh, and you have generating functions, which will be fields. And normally physicists take E0, where G1, where G2, which can be conserved. For that reason, we have to kind of reverse this to, so that the generating function is this. This will be a uh, quantum field, if that makes some sense of that eventually, but now initially just the generating function. And then the dual field. Is then um, just Since we start to do some physics, I mean, I'm going to drop this in a minute. Let's just do the first physics comp computation that there is. So, physics 
which will, for us, be Boltz's theory. So the version of physics that happens in the office next to Bohm in another part of the world that we don't mention here, <laughs> where he's not paid quite as much. <laughs> uh, so it is that the, what physicists do with these things is that they, we, you can kind of see, actually just here, that we, when we pair these with functions, we're really thinking of them as, as distributions, which are operator values. So these, 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 this is an expansion on the, on the circle. We pair them with functions to get A of A. So these are operator value distributions. But an operator value distribution on the circle is just a Fourier series, or a power series like that, with coefficients, which are operators. And in this case, the operators are bounded, so that they all, we, we have the best of all possible worlds. And then you would compute the two-point function. This is, this is a particular case of a Whiteman function, which is supposed to, or which the theory is deduced. Uh, and that, so we will take psi z, psi star, this is a kind of formal power series thing. And if we write that out, this is the sum n less than minus 1, en, en star, omega, omega, omega is that vacuum vector, z to the n, w to the minus n minus 1. And this is just changing the, the variable, z to the minus n minus 1, w to the n. And so that's uh, 1 over z. And then we have this geometric progression. Of course, this is formal. It's a formal thing. So this is 1 over uh, W over Z. And this is 1 over Z minus W. So that's the two point function of the, of the complex Fermi. That will be, that's kind of, will be the starting point. Physical, uh, why don't you this one and not? I mean, because, no, so if you've got this, this, this is valid in the range, uh, say, uh, greater than W. If you, uh, the standard thing with Whiteman functions, if you extend them uh, in, into uh, a different domain, and then the boundary values of it are exactly the distribution which will allow you to compute, for example, AF, AG star. So, Given this function, you can compute this just by integrating n and g against this distribution for properly, properly interpreted. So that this contains all the information. So if you want to compute this on a vacuum, you can do it otherwise. But that's the principle, and that's the principle of uh, uh, one of the main principles of quantum field theory, that in order to compute smeared operators, these are called smeared operators, you, you reduce it. Yes, I would make half integers, but then you see, then this this hell. But you see, in, in this case, it doesn't really matter. So, uh, so we're working with complex fermions. You have that luxury. That's just what we're doing. Okay. So I've defined these operators. And we've seen a tiny little bit of, of physics poking its head in. Uh, what we'll, what we, it's easy to show, which means that you should look in my inventionist notes, the trick which makes it easy to show, uh, that uh, these, that the AFs, well, these are obviously bounded because, you see, if you put uh, F equals to G, then you see that A of F. 
A of, a of, F, a of F star is uh, less than the norm of F squared. It's, it's different. It's back to minus a positive operator. So they're bounded operators. Uh, to show that A F A G F here is equal to box space. Well, so essentially what we did. So what the ingredient here. Was the, the ingredient here was uh, really the projection P, P of H, which was uh, splitting the Hilbert space up into two bits. Uh, and in the example, this would be equal to the Hardy space on the circle if we make the identification. With, of the E ends with E to the I n theta. But equally well, we could start off, you could take any other, any other projection. And in this case, with uh, Q of H, <laughs> one minus Q of H, you can mention one. And you could, you could take an orthonormal basis, Q, uh, Q, Q of H perpendicular, uh, just be the linear span of F1, F minus 1, F minus 2, for some choice of orthonormal basis there, and repeat the construction, then you get, get a representation, an area, an area of uh, those relations. And we can recover P just I mean we're doing operator algebras, so that these form the CAR algebra, and we could just ask for the we can just look at the, the vacuum what, what the, 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 the uh, pure state given by the vacuum vector. So the pure state given by omega is just These form a, a base, a base, a good basis of, of the CAR algebra. And it's a sense, uh, the span is dense, and this is just delta in M of depth P F I G J. Right. So uh, the representation in this way, without choosing, I've made a choice here of basis. This shows that the representation only depends on P, because uh, we just we keep the vacuum that the state is defined purely by P. And then the two representations are unitary equivalent. P and Q define uh, unitarily equivalent reps. And this is due to Irving Siegel. Or probably a lot of other people, probably some Russian people if you're in Russia. P and Q define unitary equivalent representations if and only if P minus Q is a Hilbert Schmidt operator. Now that's not particular, I can give you a little sketchlet for the proof because the whole, a lot of this story depends on the same trick, which is the story of Q projections. So we may as well. Remind ourselves of some of the things that happen with two projections. So, if P minus Q is Hilbert Schmidt, well, the story of two projections, depending on who you are, uh, revolves around the fact that P minus Q squared is sensible. And so, if it's compact, just do the, uh, so this is compact, do the uh, eigenspace decomposition. Then you can choose uh, if P and Q are sort of in, in general position. You can kind of what you do. So 
but that this is your uh, p vector, and what you do is you just you choose these so you can find two-dimensional subspaces where p acts as this, and then q is 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 just uh, whatever it is in terms of columns and signs. And then uh, just choose these vectors so that they lie in these two dimensional subspaces to reduce it to a finite dimensional thing. And then what you do is, uh, provided P and Q uh, are not too far apart, and that's enough to do the thing, then you can, uh, you just, after a certain stage, you just substitute E's here. And then you can check that this vector, you can compute, uh, check that if these differ by a Hilbert Schmidt operator, that these vectors actually uh, converge, they form a Cauchy sequence. Check they form a Cauchy sequence. And then, and then obviously the limit of that will be at the state of so you explicitly show that in the Fox space of P, choosing the bases properly, you can construct the Fox the, the vector of Q. So it's as simple as that. And just this trick here. So two projections. Uh, right, well, the next thing to do is to, to, to have uh, a group acting. And so the group of automorphisms, which are Bogolubo automorphisms, <coughs> is when you take initially the unitary group of H. And that will act on the Sending A of F to A of U of F will define an automorphism of the CAR. And then you can ask in the Fox space, can this automorphism be implemented? And the condition for that is that. Uh, uh, well, what that means is that U A of F by some unitary will just implement so U a unitary box space. Well, because of irreducibility, this is unique. If it exists, it's unique up to multiplication by Z in the circle. And, well, if you just translate back to this, uh, this representation is equivalent uh, to, our, I might have got something slightly wrong, to the representation of UPU star. And so the condition is, so this is if and only if UP, the commutator, is Hilbert Schmidt. And so these define a group which Graham Siegel calls the restricted unitary group. Uh, and I'm just going to consider you get the group. Well, actually, I can do this here. I don't have to worry about whether you know what Fredholm operators are, because you all are supposed to know that. So, so that's this group. Well, then A, so this is an inverter, this is a unitary on H. Then A and B, A and D are Fredholm. Fred for short, and B and C are Hilbert Schmidt. So that's restricted unitary group, and that, because of this, will act by a projected unitary representation on Fox space. This is just the unitary group modulo its center, those scales that appear there. Now, for the purposes of uh, going to the 
physical objects, and in particular to the vertex operator of the direct plane, the psi of z. Psi of z is called the a vertex operator. They're really the easiest kind of vertex operators. So they're the, also called fields. They're called fields, but we uh, vertex operators they're called called that. I, I guess when string theory came along, the dual resonance theory was called that. So, uh, but we. When we get to Borchers, the Borchers, Borchers country of physics, we will call them vertex operators. They are fields as well. A field is like us, we're analysts and think of them as operator value distributions. But for people in algebra, they're kind of formal something or others. Formal power series expansions, which are probably something. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, now we're going to do something rather naughty. Because uh, we do. So, really, so what happens here? So, we have. But let's just look at. We have an object which we call the Grassmannian, and that is all project. We fix our projection p, which you could think of this Hardy space projection. You look at all q's which differ from it by a Hilbert-Schmidt operator. Now this is a set of subspaces which aren't too far from p, and that that is uh, uh, so. Uh, this is a homogeneous space. So this acts. You track, you fix the P. Yeah, you fix the P. So P is a reference. P acts transitively on these. So this group, and just by U, P, U star. So it's a homogeneous space. But just like in finite dimensions, we know the Grassmannian, so K dimensional, N dimensional subspaces of two N dimensional space is a complex space. The way of seeing that is to, to go to a complex group. So, and even in finite dimensions, it's convenient then. Right, so uh, first of all, note you can have the connected component of this. Well, there is, uh, in, in, the, in this group, we have a kind of unilateral shift, a bilateral shift, which gives some kind of index. These are the things where A and D have index zero. And so they're of the form a unitary plus a finite rank. And then the similarly, we can take the connected component of the grass manual in it, and what will happen here is by the same thing, P, Q, uh, P, QP will be a Fredholm operator from P of H to Q of H, <coughs> and just by this kind of relation, the, 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 it will have a single invariant, which will be its index, so uh, you have an index of this. Connected component is uh, equals the Q such that QP has index zero. And needless to say, this U zero this acts transitively. Now we want to do the complex picture. So the thing this is something that slightly can well it confused me, it confused Paul a little bit. I believe. Well, I mean just because it seems that you're going outside. I mean if we have something that's non-self the job, we just feel fine with you. Often. Professor, you often feel fine with you. Yeah, we don't have something to solve the job. 
Anyway, so we'll see examples of this. Instead of having, having a projection, we'll have an idempotent, which is a bounded operator. So e squared equals e. If it were, if it were self adjoint, it would be a projection. And this will be, so even if we start off, and well, we can, the, the starting, and then we can have start off. Right, and then we can have other items like this. And again, we look at the space of uh, idempotents, which vary from this by a, 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 a Hilbert-Schmidt operator. And then we have the restricted unitary group. And I'll just take this connected component. The other thing will be kind of clear. So A. D are equal to our invertible plus finite rank. That, that's just another way of saying index zero. And B and C are the other string. But otherwise, uh, and the whole thing is invertible on this field of space, which seems to be getting uncurled. This is right. Well, these act on self of these <coughs> act on idempotents in exactly the same way, uh, just like this. And the uh, this is this is a, uh, a, a homage, this is uh, the act so this gives a transitive action. In the usual way, you just identify the two spaces. You identify E, E of H, E as identified with P, if E of H is equal to P of H. Now, there's a canonical way of getting from a. Uh, that, that would be possible. Actually, in this, I mean, like I said that here, E will be subjoint. So part of the part of the game here. So the, the reference projection E will be subjoint in E, and so it'll just be the X. So, um, and then it will be automatic the dash. So for, for you, Chris, the conditions of the diagonal for uh, on so on the equivalent is really what the the It's the same. It's the same thing. So, so this is just the set. GP is equal to the Hilbert Schmidt operator. It's actually the same. You can even write down about you know your favorite Banach algebra, of which you know one is the, the unitary bit and the other subject uh, is, is the, the, just the invertible bit. Same as my first one was fine. Yeah. Or trace plus or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, yes. Is there a, so this is actually smaller than the trace plus. But no, but it's the same thing. I mean, once you've got to trace plus, you just have to do that. Being invertible is fine and ranked the same as being invertible plus any of those things. I mean, I could just say trace plus. Although it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, just, it's just, you just vary it a little, just a tiny little subtract off to get a like this and the thing that I've run for Sorry? Yeah, exactly. I have a question about the meaning of the 2 by 2 matrix. So is this with respect to the... So this is with respect to P1 minus P, P1 minus P. So but, but, but now P is E, and E is not self-adjoint. So no, P, it is still P. Oh, I see. So you are still actually P. thinking about P. Still P. Okay. So P and E actually will be more or less the same here. Just that was just for the So anyway, if you have, so let me call it F, which is a bad notation if you're if you do uh, KK theory. But anyway, so F is supposed to be an item movement, then uh, you can go or let, let's call it E, then 
that correspondence there, you can write down this closed formula, which is much used by people in complex function theory or theory of body spaces. So this, this allows you to go from uh, the non self adjoint hydrophobic <coughs> projection. That's an easy exercise. It's almost in Bruce Blackett articles. It's almost in his book. Mm -hmm. so it's a little more complicated. It is more complicated. Uh, because it kind of, yeah, I mean, it's got some square in there and then some compensating things. But this is, but for doing computations, this is, it, it is the, the good one. It's Kirsten. So the formula is if E is an E is an isotope, and P the orthogonal projection onto the range of E. This is equal to the orthogonal projection onto the range of E. And then the other thing that we were going to use is that if in, in this sort of situation that we'll be in, we'll actually have E will be So if E star is equal to D, then we'll have, in fact, uh, uh, the, the two project the two the item of the projection will always satisfy a relation E F is equal to E. And in this case, we can move F to E by a particular uh, in this general position, we can move uh, one to the other. This, this turns out to be invertible in, in, in the situation that we want to look at, which is which I'll write down fairly soon. And this group element and sense is invertible. It's in uh, this restricted linear group that takes one to the other. So now why am I writing these formulas down in this detail? Well, the point about doing this is that I want to say what I've now given a complex structure because I can say what is a complex map into the Grassmannian. Well, it's simply a map into eigenfunctions, which is holomorphic, a coefficient by coefficient, or however I want to do it. Or perhaps I'll say the different things of the Hilbert Schmidt operators, because this will differ from the starting thing by Hilbert Schmidt operators. And equally well, with a formula like this, if E is fixed and F is varying holomorphically, then G will vary holomorphically. So it's clear that, that the advantage of passing to the uh, that this general linear group is that we can have some, if we have a dependence on a complex variable, it's very clear what we mean by holomorphic. And the same is true in, in just in finite dimensions. If you want to say what a map into the Grassmannian is, you can't lift projections to a holomorphic family can't have a holomorphic family of projections, but you can lift them to either person to the same range, and that will be what holomorphicity means. So presumably there's some ambiguity in E of J, which is in lots of other person projections to the same. That's true. But you see, in, in this kind is a canonical form. Uh, and in, in fact the E of Z will be you don't have any choice. You don't prefer to remain holomorphic. Yes. Or, I mean or, or even just uh, you can't think, it's clear what the projections are. So, right, so now I have to tell you uh, so we have a, a group, group represented, we have group represented, ah, that's the next thing. So now uh, I've told you that the restricted unitary group X, and now I'm going to tell you how the general link, so the U rest of X, I haven't said how, acts projectively on Fox space. We haven't actually t said, we can't write down how it acts, but now I'm going to tell you. So we'll take the charge zero, we'll describe now an action GL rest of H on the charge zero part of Fox space. So that's the thing.
things which before so born correctly, correctly. These are exactly the things where you've only you just moved a few, you've moved the e minus ones all over, just moved them up along this side. The net number really hasn't changed. So that's so these give a basis. I one. Well, if you look, so if you think about the boxes, that uh, the, this this will give a series of occupied boxes. So the unoccupied boxes can be specified by J one less than J two, and then less than uh, P plus one. So, so you have the kind of a complementary uh, Hilbert. Well, this, these form, let me call this, just using a name for this, O of S, for the set of vertices, ordered in this, the set of, uh, of, of these, ordered in this way. And then the complementary basis, We'll have the Hardy space, and then a canonical map preserving the order onto the ones that have been left out, put in the, in the, in the increasing order. So this is, these will be negative, some of these will be negative. So what we've done is we've slightly, we've taken this Hardy space and then we've just, the first few of these have been moved into the orthogonal complement of Hardy space and that accounts for these. And then we can find a canonical, a canonical partial isometry from this onto this ending, I should call this J0 probably. J0, E0 onto J0, E1 onto EJ1, and eventually this will be the identity. So we've just moved a, series, a set of the bases partially uh, into the negative thing. And that's sort of complementary to what's happening here. So it's best seen with the, if we shade or unshade boxes, you can see exactly what's going on. And essentially you're just systematically moving the boxes back. That's sort of clear to people. Are you just describing the action of the element of your best? Not yet. I'm just setting up a partial isometry, which is like going to allow me to describe that. Between what and what? Well, this is between Hardy space and then the slight perturbation of Hardy space. This is another, this is one of the other projections, a kind of canonical kind of projection in the, in the Grassmannian, in the connector components, where I just moved, it's kind of like an abelian. Some very simple way of moving, of, of describing another another element of the Grassmannian just by shifting any finitely many things in an ordered way. So you've just taken some p vectors and changed them to other. Yes, move them. I've moved them to, in, into the negative bit. It's a few of them. That this is a very important point. It's something that Graham doesn't talk about. So it's a for a finite subsystem. Yes. Right, but notice it's for each basis vector of the of of of, of fog space or this uh, charge zero part, uh, I have one of these. Each of them corresponds to something like this. Okay. Well then. So then the next ingredient, so I want to define the central extent, so I have this element of the restricted, I'm defining as born the same, I'm going to define uh, the, uh, an action, a projective action of GL of the rest as matrices. So this is an element of this connected component. So that means I can find Q in G 
GL of H plus, H plus is T, T of H, which is invertible, such that A cube inverse is 1 plus 12. Final rank of trace plus. That much is a 1. Okay. And then the Graham group. is just the set of these G's and Q's. So this is a kind of extension of one group by the other, of GRS by the group of operators which are invertible and modular, which are invertible and are performed one plus trace plus. And then, well then you can define a representation of this group on Fox space, or just this charge zero, charge zero part. And you just have to give the matrix coefficient, so omega s, omega t. And that will be the determinant of dt star g, d s, So these these operators are unbounded, but you can write down you can write down their matrices, and amazingly enough, they do multiply. So that's a, a trick that Graham Graham notes, which is it's just a factorial property of, of exterior algebras to show these multiply. So pi G Q and pi pi G one Q one. So, but the, the, uh, you can, this would work equally well for unitary operators. It's easy to show that they're unitary. Then, see for unitary operators now, if you will just want to take this, then uh, just if you for unitary operators, you can take a Q to the unitary, and then if you just take the usual vacuum. Square this, then the multiplication for formula on formula for uh, determinants will give that this is P U D U uh, P U D star P, which is the one that we sort of made. So the so the absolute value of this is now. This this is a more it's more explicit. And you can kind of follow it through if you want to do a particular computation, which we do. Right. So that, so that what Graham describes in his book and in the article of uh, uh, George Wilson is just the vacuum point. He doesn't actually say it's a vacuum. Actually. He doesn't actually write down the partial isometry. Essentially that. Everything else is sort of explicit. He doesn't actually write. But his view of these complex representations, representation, these complex groups, uh, is that they act on a much bigger space, which goes beyond the Hilbert space. Uh, and you know, he has these holomorphic sections of line bundles where you haven't a clue what the inner product is on the product. I mean, it will be there on some subset. But this, so this is kind of a poor man's version of that, where you can see that on that it will take nice vectors to kind of rather horrible vectors that you can compose. And you can prob there's probably some way of making sense of it uh, within the language of reason Simon. That must be what it is. But, uh, certainly the things that multiply these row against column, they converge absolutely. So I think that's that's good enough for me. It's still mysterious, but, but, but there are, that's part of, if you like, 
that point about the holomorphic induction is it has that kind of element of mystery in it, that you would like to get a Hilbert space and there's not a Hilbert space. In some, some cases, there's not a Hilbert space in sight. So you have to... Sorry, I didn't really catch what the mystery of this morning was. Well, the mystery of the time. No, no. Uh, so, how, in what sense is this, so that these group, the group, of, and I've told you how they act on, on just these orthonormal bases, and then they give you a genuine vector in the space, and then you're allowed to compose. But uh, finding some mathematical language uh, that would allow, I mean, these are unbounded operators, which would allow you to say what's really happening there. You know, is there some domain that they leave invariant? Uh, I have no clue about. That's usually what happens in these cases. Is you can kind of uh, put some on, some kind of Laplacian, some operator there, and then they would leave the analytic vectors of that operator. Uh, you know that that would be uh, a domain on which they acted, which they left invariant. But it's not. It's not quite like that. So this bias GQ is that's an unbounded operator. It's an unbounded operator. But if uh, U is U, G is unitary, and it's a unitary. Operator, just uh, because actually you also have that what makes it particularly easy to see is that you can, if you take the formal adjoint of this with respect to that basis, will be this. And then these two formulas together will show that if you start off with something unitary, uh, the answer is. I mean, it would be quite interesting to you know, make, make more mathematical analytic sense of what that's what you're saying. That the the range won't be zero, right? There's nothing that there's no else who vectors that go to the zero. Oh, yes, all these basis vectors go. But they do go to the Oh, yes, that's the whole point. So they preserve this. It's, it's what you call this coherent states, usually, that you start off with one vector and then you. That, that, that set of vectors. Okay, so now, well, what I'll, I'll describe the what, what are going to be the projections. So, what's going to happen here? So, let the, we're going to take something like that, or something like this, and we're going to. We want to have a, a, a projection corresponding to it, or an idempotent. Sorry, maybe I missed. So, what is the relevance of the trace class condition? I mean, why? What? Why do you? Why do you have to have it? Yeah. This you could just, you just check. Oh, that this, this is sufficient. That this the, uh, this, this operator here is is one plus trace class. Uh, that that's you. It's on, it's on, this, this is an operator which is on P of H. So then you don't have to go, it's got all the common bits and then. Yes. But it's not, the, it's not taken into that domain, it's, it's not an invariant. It'd be nice if the usual thing is something like C infinity vectors or N infinity vectors, which are carried into themselves. <coughs> and, and perhaps if you add some an extra operator, uh, you could do that. But for the moment, it, this is so general. I mean, if you had a loop proof, then you could take L0 and then control L0. Anyway, so here is the picture. So these are Riemann surfaces. Uh, this bit is the Riemann surface, but there's an inside and an outside. And so now I have to describe the two the projections. Projections are nine of them. Well, the Hardy space projection is easy enough to describe. So P well the boundaries are parameterized. So you just take, if you like, in this case, polynomials in Z Z bar. Sorry, just in Z. Polynomials in Z, restrict them to the boundary and take the L2 closure. So it's the L2 closure. Polynomial Z on the boundary, which is L2 of these SIs. Uh, 
find hard. Yes, we're just going to do it in the middle. It's what you see is what you get. It's, it's a double fried egg. I almost feel like saying yo. So I mean, I mean, so that, that, this is hard to handle. I mean, if you take something like this, I mean, even this, this would be another example, just a simple fried egg. Not a, not a good one. Uh, and even in this nice model where it's perfectly symmetric and wonderfully produced, you try to write down, you can write down the orthonormal basis, but it's a bit, you know, it's tricky to deal with. And this is even more tricky to deal with. People have written it down. So, in general, uh, the, the E, which is the Toshi projection, is easier, is better. What that consists of doing is taking, well let me just do it in this case, this is, even in this, in this case of a single circle, <coughs> just take 1 over 2 pi, I take f on the boundary, and then the integral around that of z minus theta. And the theta normal will sit inside. which is moving up, <coughs> moving up towards the boundary. And then these operators will tend towards an idempotent. So identifying these with the outside. So the T sidon X tend towards E, which is called the Toshi projection. And, as, as you can kind of see, it's a limit of holomorphic things from the inside, so it's in the Hardy space. So this, and the range of this is the Hardy space. Well, that's, can I go on for another five minutes? The time is, uh, okay. Well, so, that, that's that. Well, this has a disadvantage of having to go off the boundary. So, I mean, we're expressing it as some kind of limiting process, and if we wanted to compare one thing with another, we'd need some kind of conformal transformation from one to the other. And the fact of the matter, and this is why I advertise this book, because I do quite like it, this is a book by Steve Bell, where he kind of, he develops Hardy spaces from scratch, just to sort of Kind of almost uh, as an operator theorist, and then as uh, producing these projections, he is able to prove the. He shows that just knowing the projections and the kernel operators that define them, you can then that they, that immediately implies the 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 re, and it's, there's an explicit formula for the uniformization in terms of the kernel of, of the p operator, and then there's a corresponding operator called the Garabedian operator, and that allows you to prove in closed form the uniformization. So you don't, it's, uh, as a, in some, so in some ways, the Cauchy kernel operator uh, can be used as the guiding principle for discussing everything else. Uh, but that's certainly uh, what's done is, I like his book, sometimes. He starts off in the C infinity category, no, it's, it, it really, it's kind of fun, nicely written, fun to read. Uh, so, uh, in the uh, case of the tree, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So you can't do this. So if you do that, you get the outfalls now. No, I mean, it could be for the uniformization. It could be the same thing, exactly the same. Some of the yeah, the same, the, exactly the same thing. Of the, but exactly. So this, this, and this, is, this is the analysis behind this is quite easy. He doesn't actually define it that way, but he shows it's equivalent. So you do, first of all just work, uh, you know. 
That's the yeah, that's the density theorem. I should probably, I mean, to be quite honest, I should probably allow rational functions with polar set aside. Oh, I yeah, see. Yeah, I think oh, so. Let's just say like that rational functions with polars. And side uh, sigma. But I, I think you can actually just allow, just pick individual points here. And let the, it's oh. enough to just have the poles of three designated points. One that could be infinity. Yes, obviously, what I said was rubbish because it doesn't work for the. It doesn't, yes. I think it works for the dust. You give me that. Right. So, now, so what happens here? Well, in. Uh, So then, in, this is exactly the case. You have this motion projection. So then, this was, I think, they, the people in uh, complex function theory are very, they, they like this formula because they can handle the Cauchy integral operator. That's easy to, that's easy to sort of solve. And you just write that as a formula, more or less. That can become even more of a formula in a minute. Uh, and then that in, in enables this to be clear that if E and F are close, then so will the orthogonal projections. And so computing things with these non subordinate things is obviously quite easy because it's just integrals. Uh, you know, uh, what can I say? So, well, I'll say this. So if, going back to the circle, so, uh, the, so we have this, the Hardy space of the circle, and then we can, so when we have these, in fact, what people did traditionally was uh, they, they considered uh, these operators. Right, well, So they excluded from, uh, so th this would be four point zeta on the circle. So you exclude, and then you actually transfer that this, this is now transferred to the circle. So, you, so you've excluded uh, a singular bit. And these operators, so it's just a, so what you can, so you have two ways, this, this operator, What's going to happen is this will tend, uh, in some uh, strong sense or strong operator topology, the, the norms will be bounded. I'll explain that in a minute. This will converge to. I've, I've put one over pi i then, so one over two pi i. So this will converge to two p minus one to two e minus one. Okay, this it's still, in the, it's still in the circle, but zeta is now lying on the circle itself. Oh, it is? Yes, so zeta is actually in the circle. And I'm ex and to define this, I'm excluding a little range around zeta. And then, so this is then, this, in this case, this would be p, because I'm on the circle, but in, it, it applies equally, equally in all these other situations. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what's called a Hilbert transform. It's the version that we know on the circle. So, so what is the integral taken over? What's the sum This is of uh, say equals one. So what the, the, the game to prove this, it's obvious if f is smooth, because you can just subtract off an f zeta here, and then f z minus f zeta over z minus zeta is a nice function. Then you can just you can just check 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 this by sort of copying. Yeah, you just you can just check check this very easily. Uh, so the main thing 
It's therefore to prove that these are bounded. These, these, the, the T means. And that's, this is, you, so the, the books on uh, bounded analytic functions of people like Garnett and uh, Gamelin do, do all this as part of their, their ancient history, which the, we have to know the double commutator. Start off, and they have to know this theorem and what all of there is. So what what happens is that so the proof that this is so we have these on the circuits very easy to do. So the integrals around here are, are bounded. I mean you can do that because you just if they're diagonalized by Fourier trans in the Fourier series. So you, they just multiply by r to the n and all the positive bits, and then you estimate the difference between those operators and these operators. Show it goes to zero. With epsilon suitably, this will be determined by this, uh, the length of this interval here. So you show that the T, T epsilon can be compared with the integral over S epsilon using the Hardy Littlewood maximal function. There I'll set it. I'm close to length. Slightly tricky computation. It's, it's not tricky. Once you've uh, written down the Hardy Littlewood maximum function, you can then just check that it proves that the norm differences between these norms remains finite. So I don't see intuitively where you're picking up the norm minus zero difference. It looks to all the world like it's in the case of the projection. But it doesn't. Because it's on the circuit. Why should it be one side or the other? Why should it be? Well, we live in a fair world. So when you're taking it over the circle, the circle, if you're doing an integral over the circle, it doesn't know whether it's inside or outside, so you better take the average. Yeah. Or the difference. That, that's, that's democracy. We live in a different world. Here in Nashville. Subadjoint projections is this, so, which, which is all part, of, it's all part of the story. So that that kind of uh, right. So uh, that's kind of, and that applies equally well here. So if you do, if you now do these integrals by leaving out a, a single, this is a called a principal value integral, then you will get uh, the one uh, two f minus two f minus one. By that process. That's an integral which is just straight on the. So, on the three circles, on three circles, you've not moved off that. So, you see, they see the outside and the inside. Uh, so, just to perhaps I'll end with this. So, then the Riemann, so perhaps I'll, I'll do a little, just another little thing. So, Riemann Hilbert problem. So you would like to write, uh, if you're given uh, uh, a boundary value, smooth boundary values, you'd like to write f, so it's more or less or more the same. There's a difference between something analytic on the interior uh, and analytic on sigma minus, so the boundary value is something holomorphic on sigma minus, minus the boundary value is something holomorphic on sigma plus. And well that's very easy. So let me, so the f, so one, so the f of f is holomorphic, is a boundary value of a function, holomorphic. This is why it's important to see this is the boundary value of something on the sigma plus. And evidently f is equal to f, f plus one minus f. So that's the 
that's just the, the, the additive read that Hilbert put in. Uh, and that, that's, that's kind of used in checking the, the relation E of N. So that's one advantage of this. And let me just now do something which Alain calls, so this is, uh, this will have some question marks attached to it. So the uh, Burkhoff equation. Or the best one. With a question mark next to it. The, the Burkhoff decomposition this is sort of a Birkhoff decomposition. It's writing f as something. Uh, if I exponentiate it, I'm writing a loop into the circle. If, if f was sort of real uh, or, or purely imaginary, as a product of a loop of sort of a holomorphic thing inside and a holomorphic thing outside. So that will be for a loop group. Diffeomorphism group is something which provides a little more difficulty. It's also part of this picture, uh, but so what, hap what happens there is I start, I'll just start off with a simple domain uh, like this, and then so the, 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 this, by the way, it's interesting that Mumford, although he was reputed to have left mathematics, uh, he did shape theory, and then he became seduced by the Cauchy integral operator, for which we. In his paper, a very simple formula appears, which is going to solve this problem. So, if I'm given a shape like a, a domain like this with a smooth boundary, then I can find a uniformizing map from the disk to it, which maps the boundary smoothly onto the boundary. Well, equally well, so that's just sigma minus. Equally well, so uniformizing equals sigma plus union infinity <coughs> on the ring sphere. Similarly, I have a uniformizing map of the disk. Here, I could think of it as the the uh, it would be of the upper the upper hemisphere, almost the lower hemisphere, the upper hemisphere. And then well, what I'll get on the circle is so the boundaries Boundaries are the same. Oh, are you saying what is sigma minus and sigma plus? And sigma, six, six, sigma minus is the outside. And sigma plus is the inside. But there's no need boundary. No, I'm just taking a simple. This is just but a sigma, it's just a dis, or just a, a deformed shape like this. Well, then, so this, but then I'll, I'll have a map. This gives a map. From uh, uh, the S one to the S one, so it's a, it's a little more. And you sort of, if you, so if I call this F and this G, and this phi, then writing phi as G inverse. Uh, well, it's yeah, ring F. That is supposed to be the bird box. You could, put, you could even put something inside to scale it. But at least that's not. Now, in the form, so I've got, I've, if, you want to get, you want, if you want to prove that everything can be obtained that way, then uh, what happens is using uh, this, you can check for a diffeomorphism. I might have got some factor. This operator, which is essentially the, the uh, this is the Hardy space, this is the diffeomorphism acting. So you, you just have to think you can check that this is almost f, f transferred to the circle, is equal to e to the i theta. So you, you, solve, you solve that, and that gives you back f. So that this is something from Montford. I mean, I, I find this quite frightening, some of these in algebra geometry. Find any reference to, to it anywhere else in the literature. But even Mumford's 
writings on it don't seem to be covered by maths, maths reviews. They somehow, I don't quite know what's going on there. It might, it might be because shape theory is considered to be engineering, or computer vision. Mm, it could be one of them. It could be, but I haven't found it in the book. I haven't found it in the book. I mean, this is kind of called informal welding. Anyway, so that's that. So just uh, a final thing. So you're saying that the, the good version of the Riemann probably did do this with what you did? No, so that this, if I exponentiate this, this would be a kind of loop, a loop version of the loop. And here, the geomorphism loop is rather more complicated. But uh, so just to say what, what so, but you see, this, there will be a kind of the, the diffeomorphism group will act. What you want to do is have these two things represented by operators. And somehow, in the people that do it, so in that you, you know you have these uh, these vector fields, e to the i n t i e to the n d by d theta, complex vector fields, and which generates the vector fields, and so the Lie algebra, the diffeomorphism group of the circle. And it's split up into two parts. So uh, as, as a Lie algebra, you would know how to do the decomposition. It would just be splitting up uh, into well, almost like this Hardy space thing. The LF, the linear span of the L minus ends, uh, direct sum with the linear span of L0, L1, something like that. And that would be a kind of triangular decomposition, which is what the Birkhoff decomposition is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be like taking, uh, saying that every matrix is all, almost every matrix product of a lower triangular times an upper triangular, uh, just an invertible matrix, which is almost true, you would say you have to have some SN, you have to have some permutation matrix or something that's true. Uh, and then here, I think, so the physicists, or the people that do conformal field theory, write these as some kind of formal exponentials of operators in, in here. And so uh, a, a thing which, uh, needs to be clarified is why this kind of analytic problem, uh, you can write down operators for all these objects, why those things should correspond. Uh, so, so, but th this is, uh, Anna uses this Birkhoff decomposition, but he does it in a purely formal, kind of formal, this is formal diffeomorphisms. So just a formal power series. But I think in this case, uh, probably do it so that actually you know, the operators are banded operators, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So what is the The renormalization I mean, is a prime. But, but it's, it's I mean people write Britain. The Britain are still writing people. But that that's so he used the uh, it's on the different orders and on the line, but it's it's no different. It's really not any different. So it's, it's so just one thing to finish with. Is although here we have non self adjoint operators, uh, life is not as bad as all that because the adjoints are easy to describe. So on, on these domains, just as on the circle, but on the circle we have two things. We have J, which takes a function to its conjugate. Uh, and then we have our favorite. U, which is multiplication by Z. And then if you, just a simple computation will show you, so if I take the operator JU, which I call W, so it's conjugate linear, then 1 minus P is J, is W, P, W star. So that's easy to see, because if you take the basis 1 Z, Z squared, space, apply z to it, you get z, z squared, conjugate it, you get z, z box, so you get onto the ensemble of functions. Now, fortunately, and this is all in this nice book of Bell, but he doesn't quite say it in his work. If you say, well, what is the function z? It's the unit, unit output pointing normal to a point.
So, going out of the domain, and J is obvious, so the same, so what you have is one runs F star is W F W star. And that persists if you use the, if you then pass to the orthonormal, the orthogonal projection, the formula of, uh, this is W is a unitary, or that unitary operator, that formula will persist same for the orthogonal projection, one minus q is wq, w star. So, are we really out of the world? Yes, and uh, the, all of these, these operations are very simple, simple and for all of the application of vertex operators, which I'll do tomorrow. Well, these are vertex operators. Uh, this, this will play, these formulas will be a, a sort of, it's very, very clean because of all these sort of, uh, so you couldn't, you, you'd be, what happens in, uh, in a case like this, is if I take the, well, the Hardy space for the inside, and then the projection onto the Hardy space for the outside, they're not each other's complements. This is one of these, it's just a sad fact. <laughs> That's why it's accounting. There's some mismatch, I mean, there are one or two factors So it's, it's not, that's not, that they're not quite the right things to do. But whereas these things, everything is handled. You see what, what, what the orthogonal functions are very, very easily. You have you've written down the necessary operators. And then what have you. Well, I think Anthony said absolutely nothing of what he intended to say. I'm very, very grateful. Well, so the purpose of this will be that to, in the next, the next installment. So what 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 will happen to get, So if if we're given a projection, in this case. Uh, projection onto uh, L2 of S1, F1 plus L2 S3. And I've had to put things that mark the inner circles of the bar and show a different orientation. This implies a vector, a vacuum vector, a vacuum vector up to the scale uh, multiple in the Fox space. Uh, we, we take some reference reference things, or I'll say that next time, of just the outside thing, which when, when, the, when the circles don't interact, they don't see that there are other circles around it. That implies this. And that therefore implies an operator F1 tends to F2, F3, which is Hilbert Schmidt. And then the question is, what is, so what is that operator? That's sort of one of the things that will be implied by the operator. So, if I do this picture, or I choose the circles like this, then, and perhaps all this one said, then I claim that this is just, uh, well, I have to say what uh, vertex operators and vertex algebras are, I claim that this is just, and I put, vector in here, in Fox space, then I claim for A, I claim that up to some extra factors of Q to the L0, depending on various, that this operator, Hilbert Schmidt operator, between these two spaces, is just, here this is an F3, F2, So why am I doing, why am I labored in this way? Because I would, as I make Z vary, 
and can the project obviously the Koshi Koshi operators vary in a holomorphic way as I move this circle around. The Z varies holomorphically. So I'd like at least to know that the projection I'm describing, that the vectors or the operators vary holomorphically with Z. And then I can use, I haven't written down that, I can use the equation describing a vacuum vector, this vacuum vector, and showing it satisfies exactly the commutation relations of uh, the generating generating fields or vertex operators of a perfect sample. So that this is just, uh, we have to do the analysis first to convince ourselves. So, so in this case, the, the complex structure is not a standard one. You can vary the complex structure as well. Well, uh, just you can vary the <coughs> I'm doing, I, I, in this very horrible way, uh, I'm sort of just having everything yeah, you could here in this case for the actual computation here, you 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 make them you make them circles. But uh, the, the application to computer, uh, then then you might well, having done this computation, then you might I talked about the thing I talked about some years back in in, in Bank was when the eggs explode. And then, then, so this picture, this picture here, these operators should somehow be uh, intertwiner operators uh, that you would get between representations defined by Siegel fusion. The, the normal operators that appear in, in, in his definition of holomorphic fusion. And then in the limit, you would like to interpret them as some intertwiners for operators in con fusion. So this, what I'm, what I'm set up here, is sort of saying that it can't be as hard as all that. Probably, I, I, I have actually some formulas now for that, which makes it even seem even more complicated. Okay. Well, okay. So there's no more questions. We should thank you. Well, thank you, speaker. Has arrived. Yes. So strong, strong is coming. Um, maybe we'll have half an hour. I'll have Terry arrive in a minute.